know, I, uh, I want to get all of kind of like our product placement on the first page. Uh, so this is like, so you have many, many Bloomberg logos and then the rest of the talk has very few. Um, so you're welcome. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a, a topic that I've been very, very personally excited about and interested in um, uh, for a bunch of years. Um, so let me kind of tell you how I got into it. Um, uh, so uh, deep learning has had a huge has had a huge effect. Um, it's you know the first area, um, as kind of I'm sure all you guys know at this point is was in images and in image recognition. Of course, this is you know one of the most important problems in image recognition, which is is cat recognition. Um, and uh, you know the success of deep learning techniques on ImageNet um, in their you know early 2010s. Um, had a huge effect in how people thought about deep learning and how people thought about machine learning. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of successes in uh, images. Images are kind of very interesting as a problem domain. Uh, they're very dense. They have a lot of regularity. They're also kind of a surface domain. Um, you know, uh, the, the, you know a, a picture as a representation of, of a scene um, is a fairly one-to-one -one representation. Every pixel on the screen maps very naturally to a 3D point. Um, and so recovering the 3D structure and kind of recovering what's going on in the scene is fairly straightforward. Um, and it actually has been, was a number of years um, uh, after, after CATS um, that work on text uh, started to kind of have the same, see the same kind of impact as it did in images. Um, you know, it's, it's actually, and I, I come from a text world, um, that, was, that was my degree, and so, you know, for a number of years, most of the machine, the NLP conferences were somewhat lukewarm um, about deep learning. Uh, they were interested, they were, they certainly noticed the impact in, uh, in images, um, but there wasn't as much of an impact in text. Um, they, they didn't notice as much of an impact on, um, on text, and so you know the NLP community was kind of looking around, and 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 they saw small gains in a lot of uh, the the NLP techniques. And there were small gains in MT. There were small gains here and there, um, but it really didn't change the field. It was like, oh, okay, here's another technique which is a little bit better, um, unlike in images, where it's a lot better. And actually, in the past year or two, that has really dramatically changed. Um, and things are possible in NLP that weren't really possible a few years before. And the text generation is a good example. Um, so this is a GPT-2 snippet, um, you know, and it's kind of remarkable at just how fluent um, it is. It's still nonsensical um, and, uh, and gibberish, though, you know, hard to distinguish from some people at this point. Uh, and so, you know, but this kind of stuff was really not possible a number of years ago. Uh, okay, but there are a bunch of other problems. Um, so here is uh, kind of a weird little problem that we've been looking at, which is uh, scatter plots. Uh, so you have a plot of some data, and, there, and each of those points represents a, a x, y, which represents a real data point. Um, and the, the problem simply defined is you have your scatter plot, and now extract all of the data points. Uh, it's not totally straightforward because uh, you have to, there are a lot of things you have to understand about this image. Um, you have to understand, okay, well, what are the axes? What do the axes represent? What are the tick marks? What do they represent? Um, and kind of unlike images and unlike uh, natural language text, uh, there are a lot of different layers of understanding that you need to get through in order to understand this image. Here's another problem. Um, this is tables. Um, so tables, uh, again, I love boring things. Tables are pretty boring, so naturally I love them. Uh, and so, you know, a table is, you know, a bunch of rows and columns, uh, and there's stuff in the rows. Um, and, you know, in order to understand this table, there are also a lot of pieces that you have to unpack. You know, what are the, um, what are the units in each of these, in each of the columns? Um, you know, in this case, uh, this is a fairly simple table, but you might imagine that there are, you know, um, rows which are multi-rows, uh, or columns which are multi-columns, and so that, you know, the, even there's a little bit of a hierarchical structure um, that encodes what the semantics of the table are, apart from, you know, the actual physical numbers. Um, 
And then one of the interesting things, as you can see, is actually a little program, a, a dopey little program maybe, but it's a little program which defines this table. This is LaTeX. Uh, LaTeX, uh, of course, is Turing complete. Uh, and so uh, this is, is a, Turing, a sample from a Turing complete program. Um, but again, it's a fairly simple program. Um, and actually, the state of the art on tables um, is, is actually not that great. Um, so we did some uh, experiments. We've, we've published a bunch of work. Um, had a, a great intern, uh, Yun Tian Deng. Uh, she did some early work on equation understanding. You have a picture of an equation. You want to recover the, the actually the, the formula, the LaTeX formula. Um, and uh, then we applied this model to tables. Um, and the way we collected these tables was we looked at archive um, and we scraped all the documents on archive and we extracted all the table segments. So these are kind of fair, natural tables. Um, and now you have a training and a test set. You can regenerate all these tables. And we looked at performance at recovering the LaTeX structure of these tables. Um, and the performance is, is actually really not that great. It's around 40% um, of Yun Tian's model at complete uh, text recovery. We also made this, uh, this data set um, downloadable, so there's about 400,000 of these uh, scraped LaTeX tables that you can get to through uh, UNTN's website, uh, or his GitHub, I guess. Um, so there are a few things. So one is, uh, you know, the performance on recovery from these images of this table um, is actually pretty bad. And especially bad, you know, you, you would think that a cat recognition is a harder problem than table recognition, tables again, pretty boring, cats are kind of fun. Uh, but actually it's a fairly hard problem. Um, and, it, and once you start to think about it in that way, it starts to expose that, you know, a lot of the problems that have, you know, been pushed by machine learning and by deep learning are on fairly surface, I don't wanna say easy problems, they're very hard. Uh, but they're kind of surface problems. Now, again, you know, it might be possible that uh, tables are so boring, we haven't, as a community, expended as much energy into understanding tables as we have to understanding images. It's possible. Um, and it also might be possible that there's some underlying phenomenon. Okay, but tables are a instance of a program, a very, very simple, simple program. Um, but actually, there are many more complicated programs. So this is a snippet of code. Uh, from from one of uh, you know my my personal uh, you know uh, uh, what is it you know uh, people that you aspire one of my personal idols uh, Kerningham and Pike this is a regular expression this is a complete regular expression uh, parser um, it's it's fairly simple it, it has like makes a few number the language that it accepts is small but you can see this is uh, you know again forty or so lines of code maybe twenty lines of code. Uh, it's kind of remarkable. Um, and the amount of phenomenon that it describes is vast. The, the, the thing that it's actually computing, whether you know, a, a regular expression has, whether a string has matched a regular expression, is a, uh, an arbitrary regular expression is a fairly deep kind of a thing to process. Um, you know, so, you know, one of the, so for the, the rest of the talk, I'm gonna do two kinds of things. Um, one is I want to tell you a little bit about various things people in the literature have done to think about programs, modeling programs, learning programs. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about this other problem that I have become uh, uh, very obsessed with um, to the point that uh, I think my kids are going to start teasing me about it, uh, which is uh, software fuzzing. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. I'm going to tell you why I've been obsessed by it. Um, and some of the things that, that we've discovered through it. Um, so, you know, one of the first things you, you might think about when you're thinking about uh, programming is, um, or learning programs is, you know, what can, can, um, uh, can deep learning or machine learning synthesize programs de novo? You know, we can synthesize language, that's pretty awesome. Can we synthesize programs? So let me tell you about the most successful um, synthetic programs out there. Um, so, so this is it. Uh, you may have used it. Um, this is the Excel flash fill uh, plugin. You, uh, you have some columns and you fill in kind of your initial data and then you have another column where you fill in the piece that you want to extract from it. 
Um, and then the model learns. This is a programming by example kind of paradigm um, and, and generates a program that then extracts. Now, what does it actually learn? It's, not, it's learning a very small subclass of programs. Um, which are regular expressions. Uh, regular expressions are little finite state machines. Um, and so it generalizes. And you know, one of the nice things about this kind of paradigm is that you know, as you're going through, you can update and tweak and kind of add examples if, you've, if you notice that it's you know, going in a weird direction. Um, and this, uh, this work, which is now deployed and used kind of throughout the world, um, was a huge, huge achievement. Uh, and, a, and a huge software achievement. Um, and this is you know, fairly state of the art, learning regular expressions. Um, and this is maybe 2012, 2013, around there. Okay, so, so this is like small kind of a language, small kind of a program. Let's see what um, you know, neural you know, architectures can do. Um, so this is um, a beautiful piece of work uh, that came out of deep, uh, Google Brain, I think, actually. Uh, in 2014, it was a neural Turing machine. Um, and so here they took a LSTM, um, and the LSTM, in addition to outputting, uh, you know, particular output tokens, could also modify some memory. Um, and so they could store stuff, and they could retrieve stuff from memory. Um, and then they, and so they tried to see what kinds of programs this architecture could learn. And the, the pinnacle achievement uh, which was actually like really, I'm, I, I say it pejoratively, but it really was a huge achievement, was they, they wrote essentially this program, which is you take in a, a sequence of 20 characters, um, and then you take them all in, and then you output that sequence of 20 characters. That was a program. Uh, so this is uh, 2014, you know, our, uh, the world's most brilliant scientists that were working on this problem, that was the level of program synthesis that they were able to achieve. Uh, again, not pejoratively, it really was an achievement, but it's just a very hard problem. Um, so a few years passed, um, and then uh, another group, um, this was DeepMind, I think, uh, Fernando de Freitas, also brilliant, um, worked on the in architecture called a neural program interpreter. Now in the neural Turing machine, um, they also programmed it by examples. Uh, here, they programmed it a little bit differently. They, they had a program. Uh, they observed the program traces, that, the, the execution traces for the program, um, and then they used that for training. Um, and their goal was they wanted to come up with an embedding that represented a program, and then they executed that embedding by putting it through their neural interpreter. Um, and uh, this is the program that the machine learned. This is bubble sort. Um, and they did it over many, many examples. Um, and uh, again, this was a huge achievement. Um, and it was kind of amazing that it learned bubble sort at all. Um, but there was a big asterisk. They trained it up to uh, sequences of length 20. Um, and it worked on sequences of length up to length 60. And then it was kind of unstable after that. So they wrote the, you know, the program learned a bubble sort. Um, that was buggy uh, and only kind of worked on length 60 examples. This is, again, a monumental scientific achievement, but in terms of concrete practical use, it really, really is not there. Uh, it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, and again, the, no fault on the researchers, wonderful piece of work, but I think this demonstrates you know, the gap of just how difficult the program synthesis problem is. Um, and so, one thing that kind of the, one of the reactions of the field um, was to say, oh, okay, wow, that was harder than we thought. Let's try something easier. Um, and so uh, recently, there have been a bunch of groups that have looked at um, learning and learning programs in much simpler contexts. And these feel actually much more like the table problems. Um, so this is a, um, this is learning a particular kind of program. This is a 3D shape program. So you, you have this 3D image, um, and you want to come up with a, um, a, a, a program that generates that shape. Um, and so for this uh, a beautiful table, and I guess that's an end table or side table, um, you infer this program, and then you can execute this program. And, and a lot of the, this was, um, uh, this was at iClear this year. Uh, this is fresh off the press. Um, 
and uh, the, the way that they do it technically is they simultaneously uh, build two things. They build a something that uh, um, understands the image and, and brings it down to a, a, uh, a written representation, or a, a, sorry, a embedding, embedding representation, and then they learn a renderer that takes that representation and creates the 3D image. Um, and because they have the whole loop process, um, they're able to back prop through the process and learn both those pieces. Super, super interesting. Um, and very effective in, in these kinds of contexts. Learning you know, this kind of robust representation for this 3D image um, is complicated. There are a lot of nice properties this uh, representation has. It's simple, you can manipulate it, you can start to reason with it. Um, and the fact that they could learn it is, is really nice. Now, the, you know, this as a technique, learning a kind of a inference engine, which gets a program, and, uh, and a rendering engine, um, however, is a little bit specific to images. Nice thing about these images is that they're compositional. You know, the, the top of the table is going to look the same no matter what the other commands are. Um, and so you can very neatly break this program up into little pieces. Um, this isn't true for a lot of the other programs that we deal with. You know, things aren't really atomic. There's some state which is transferred. Um, and there's not th this, so, so the kinds of, of things they do here, not clear they're going to transfer. Um, but this idea has kind of been applied in another domain, this idea of, you know, simultaneously learning both an inference engine and a rendering engine. Um, to the problem of, uh, you know, learning with a black box function. So you might imagine you have some deep net and you want to call out to some other black box function. How do you integrate learning how to call out to that function and how to pre-process your data to call that out? So you might imagine you have a bubble sort. You know, how do you integrate bubble sort without learning it de novo into your deep learning model? And this is a way of doing it. And really the, the way that they do it is very much the same as this 3D shape program, which is uh, you probabilistically model your black box, um, and now that, and you write, you know, a deep net equivalent of this black box that you train, and now you can back prop through this black box, um, and then at inference time you swap out the real thing. So you say, oh, okay, well this is what I, how I imagine a uh, bubble sort might work, and now at inference time I'm just gonna plug in uh, actually, the real bubble sort, which is more robust, uh, but at least the rest of my system has been tuned so that you know it knows how to communicate to this subsidiary system. Okay, but you can see like the the gap between the aspirations in 2014, which are we're going to learn programs directly from examples using a neural Turing machine, have kind of been much reduced in 2019, um, simply because it was hard. Uh, now, of course, you know, we've been communicating with computers about code for a long time. Um, and the code that we write, I mean, is connected, though somewhat only tangentially to what the computer is actually executing. You know, there's this entire process where we take your high-level language, you know, and, and we can quibble about whether C is a high-level language, but you take a high-level language and you encode it in assembly code, and this is actually, I cheated here, this is actually not assembly code, this is the LLVM internal representation, so it's even before assembly code. Um, but you convert it into something which is fairly low level um, that is then executed uh, by the computer. And of course, you know, this process itself is not, you know, there aren't a whole lot of people that are still writing assembly these days. Everything there that people are, are doing on computers is mediated by a compiler. So kind of a natural next question is, you know, if we can't get computers to kind of synthesize programs from whole cloth, um, you know, how can we get computers to help in this process of compiling code? Um, so let me tell you about a, a paper from a few years ago which really kind of blew my mind. Um, though it was, you know, maybe obvious that you should try it. Um, it's in uh, what's called super optimization. So in the process of compilation, there are many ways to render your high-level language into low-level code. Um, and there are a lot of questions on how you want to do ordering of your statements, how you, you, know, you want to do register management, um, what you want to swap out to memory, and what do you want to keep in memory. There are a lot of very, very low-level questions. Um, 
And usually the way that people have approached them from the compiler community is to use heuristics. You know, let's, let me think about what's a good heuristic for this kind of model, or let me model this little piece and solve it exactly. Um, this, takes, this work takes a very different approach. It, what it does is for loop-free code, uh, so like if you're ever, if you're familiar with the hackers to like code, they have little snippets of code which compute something um, and they have no loops. Um, they take this loop-free code um, and they rewrite it, they reorder it. Um, and uh, what this, this paper does is it says, okay, let me look at the space of possible rewritings. Let me sample from that space. Uh, now I'm going to check, I'm going to run the program, I'm going to see how long that, that rewriting took. Um, and then, you know, depending on, you know, the constraints of my model, they, they use a Monte Carlo model to do this sampling, I'm going to decide whether to keep that rewrite or throw it out. Um, and then I'm also going to improve my sampling distribution. I'm going to observe, I'm going to observe whether that rewrite decreased the latency or didn't decrease the latency. And I'm going to somehow think about my sampling method in order to improve it. Um, so it's kind of wild because, uh, at least for me, it kind of opened the door to thinking about, okay, compilation as a learning process or a stochastic process that you might imagine optimizing. Um, whereas, you know, this, this loop-free, this super optimization, um, uh, you know, they showed, you know, using their experiments that uh, they actually got significant gains over their base compilers um, in these cases. Now, whether or not that, you know, figuring out how to scale that up to arbitrary code, which of course has loops, uh, is a big challenge, but, you know, there's this, this kind of result is the door that kind of opens to thinking about really a massive change in the way that we design our compute tools. Um, and let me give you kind of one other weird compilation example. So this is uh, actually a decompilation. Uh, so, you know, uh, often, you know, we all live in high level, or at least I mostly live in high level languages. Um, but for various applications, particular security applications, um, you want to live in a low level language. You might only have the binary as given to you by, you know, uh, some company that you're contracting with. How do you start to understand that binary and verify security properties? Um, and, and one way you might think about doing that is going from this low-level assembly code into a high-level code that can then analyze. Um, so over the, and this is a not, this is a non-trivial problem. There, there are two kind of, there, there are at least two problems that immediately jump out there. I imagine there are many, many other problems. One is that during the compilation process, if you've turned out off debugging, uh, you don't have any variable assignments, any variable names, um, and so the code is a little bit hard to read. Um, you also don't have any loops. Uh, excuse me. You don't have any nicely structured loops. You have go-tos, uh, which kind of tell you to jump someplace in the program, and you have like these branches, but uh, it, it looks like spaghetti code. That's why you write, one of the reasons you write in high-level language. Of course, all of the nicely, you know, nice object structures and pointer tables are also kind of garbled. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of structure which is lost from going to, from a high-level language to uh, assembly language. Um, and there are a lot of challenges in reversing this process. Um, and there has been some work which has kind of been very interesting on reversing this. One of the nice things from a machine learning perspective is, um, you know, with, uh, you know, in this setting, it's very easy to generate a huge amount of training data because uh, you just run your compiler. Um, and so there have been a lot of techniques that have started to use uh, neuro machine translation or, you know, neuro machine translation. Oh, my, okay. Neuro machine translation uh, with you know some additional back pieces uh, to recover, um, but there's not been a huge amount of impact. Um, so, uh, and likewise for bug fixing, um, the things that have been deployed in industry around bug fixing are very very pre preliminary. Um, so let me tell you about an area where. Um, machine learning is actually poised to have a huge impact uh, on programming, and that's in software fuzzing. 
Um, so software fuzzing is in the testing phase. Um, and so the, the definition of the fuzzing problem is very straightforward. You have an arbitrary binary, um, and you want to find uh, security flaws in that binary. Um, and the proxy to this is that uh, instead of finding flaws, you say, you say, OK, well, let me just try to explore all possible program behavior by coming up with inputs which explore as much of it as possible. Um, there are a bunch of different techniques. Um, so since we're kind of short on time, let me just talk about gray box fuzz testing. Um, so the, the idea of gray box fuzz testing is you get a binary, you're allowed to instrument it very lightly, um, and then you go through this loop, which is you have an input, you run it against the binary, you observe uh, where the, you observe the program execution, and now you choose a new input string. And now you, and you repeat. Um, so it's appealing for a lot of reasons. Uh, one reason um, is that uh, it, it feels a little bit maybe like a reinforcement learning problem and a little bit like a learning problem. Um, and uh, the other reason is that um, it's been phenomenally successful, uh, even without, you know, in a very, very simple context. So if you use heuristics and random uh, distributions for uniform random distributions, for mutation and site and child selection, um, AFL has, has really been huge. And I'll skip over this, um, but just want to flash this up quickly. Um, so AFL has been widely deployed and discovered bugs uh, on, on software I am sure that you've used. And these aren't you know, little bugs. Uh, these are security violations, you know, buffer overrides, um, memory, you know, wrong memory access. Um, and so they're, have it, this tool, software fuzzing, um, even without any, you know, with you know, almost the, the minimal amount of stochastic, stochasticity has had a huge impact on software, on deployed software. Um, and so I want to tell you two things that we've done, um, and I'll go quickly to be mindful of time, um, to think about taking this stochastic process and taking this, this problem and making it more like a machine learning problem. Um, so the first is, okay, well, if this is a stochastic process, you might imagine that, you know, what happens, let me go through the algorithm. Um, at, e at each stage, you pick a seed that you've tried before that's been productive. Um, you pick a mutation operator. Um, you apply that mutation operator to your input seed. Um, and you might do that, and you do that a number of times. And now you have a new input, and now you run that input. So... You know, the mutation operators are things like, okay, you want to flip a bit or change a byte to a special byte uh, or insert some span of code. Um, and there are about, in AFL, there are around 16 of those. Uh, it depends how you count, but you can imagine they're around 16. Um, and they're selected uniformly at random. And so one question is, well, why would you assume that uniform at random is actually the right distribution? Is there something special about that distribution? Are, is it really true that all the mutation operators are equally as good? Um, and so we used uh, something called Thompson sampling, uh, which is also known as posterior sampling, um, to, to, to think about how to uh, select these mutation operators. Uh, again, I, I'll kind of skip through. Um, but in our setting, what we used is we said, okay, each mutation operator is in action. Um, and the reward signal that I'm going to uh, train on is, did this mutated seed actually discover new behavior? Did it go down a new input path? Um, and so what we found is that um, changing just the, the distribution over mutation operators um, significantly increased the amount of uh, uh, coverage, code coverage for these input seeds. And so there really was nothing special about the uniform distribution. It was just kind of like an arbitrary distribution. We could have done a lot better. Uh, let me tell you about one more experiment we did in fuzzing. Um, so we said, okay, well, in the first kind of viewpoint, we looked at fuzzing as a process. Let's think about it instead uh, modeling the outputs. Uh, so once you've kind of gone through your process, however you did, you have a string. Is there a way to evaluate whether that string is going to be a useful string or not? Um, and so what we did is we said, OK, uh, this is our process. We are going to take this input string, um, and we're going to build a predictive model. Given this string, can I predict what 
output path, what execution trace it goes through. How does it traverse a particular program? Um, and I'm going to build a, a model. I think we built a logistic regression model, but you can imagine subsequently we've built you know deep models. Um, and so we said, okay, well, let's we're going to treat this as a modeling problem, and we're thinking about this a little bit like an active learning problem. You have uh, some candidate inputs. Which is the best candidate input to try? Um, that's going to improve your model the most. Um, and a, a fairly uh, conventional technique for active learning is is entropy. Yeah, you know, maximum entropy uh, selection. And so, so the way we implemented that was. You know, in this kind of way, you have AFL. For the, our purposes, we didn't modify the, the selection criteria. You generate a lot of different inputs using your stochastic process. Um, and then you uh, look at your predictive model and you rank all of those inputs. And then you choose the inputs uh, which the model is unsure about where they're going to go. Um, and you select those inputs to run. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, and then, uh, you know, our experimental setup, we ran AFL for a certain amount of time, we generated some seeds, we built a model, um, and then um, at that point, we, uh, we built, we used this model to do entropy ranking. Um, and so, again, here, um, the performance of this entropy model um, gave significant gains uh, over kind of a, a random AFL model. Um, Okay, so, so let me close up with just a few observations. So, you know, I've, I've gone through talking about um, program synthesis, uh, the compilation process, and finally uh, testing. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll make the argument, again, you know, in the case of uh, program synthesis, a very interesting problem, incredibly hard problem. Uh, the state of the art is very far from addressing and having any near-term industrial impact. It's a great problem for basic research. Um, in compilation, we're closer. Um, there are a lot of places where, you know, on certain arbitrary subsets, compilation process can be vastly improved, and decompilation um, is also kind of amenable. Um, however, in, in software testing, this is an area where the tools as deployed are making a significant impact, and uh, machine learning has the capacity to, to really improve these testing tools as they are. Um, so, and I, and I feel like we have really just scratched the surface. The two things that, there's a lot of work in past years on fuzzing. There's actually a, a fuzzing paper, paper at NeurIPS. Um, but the, the, the amount of information that you can get from a program and from runs on the program um, is really quite a lot. Um, and so I think that there's a, a lot of room for doing more deep program analysis um, and putting that into, uh, into the fuzzing process. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of like take one step back and you know, these are in general kind of my feelings or observations out of this work is that one is that you know, in the context of software infrastructure, uh, reinforcement learning is a very interesting technique. Thompson sampling, um, is kind of like a little baby of a reinforcement learning strategy. It's really a contextual bandit strategy or bandit strategy. It's not a, a true reinforcement learning strategy. Um, but in general, you know, once you have a computational system that you can simulate and execute many, many times, it's amenable to reinforcement learning techniques in a way that image processing uh, and natural language really aren't. Uh, robotics certainly is, but image and natural language aren't. Software infrastructure is a great area for reinforcement learning. Um, and the second is, you know, uh, there is a lot of interesting work around black box learning. Um, you know, in the case of these 3D programs, uh, there's applications there. Um, but in general, thinking about how we model arbitrary code, not for the purpose of synthesis exactly, uh, but for other purposes, testing, compilation, um, debugging, there are a lot of very interesting pieces there. Um, and then I'll take one more step back, um, which is just to say that um, machine learning on programs as objects as opposed to on images uh, or on text is, is truly in, if, in its infancy. Um, we're already, in the case of fuzzing, uh, seeing some concrete industry impacts. 
uh, to this work. And my guess is that this is an area where there's going to be a lot more impact over the next five, 10 years. Um, and that is it. Thank you very much. So thanks for the talk. It was really good. Um, when you were talking about having compilers um, replace heuristic-based approaches to sort of try and improve like um, assembly code and using like random swaps and something, I think you mentioned that the old the old approach was to have compiler writers use heuristics. Do you know if anyone ever taken a look at the output of like the the actions that those improvements have ta have taken, like the, all the swaps and random mutations, and generated new heuristics? for improving compilers? So, so um, you know, I, I didn't have time to go into, but there is actually a lot of, a lot of very interesting work out of the software engineering community um, on thinking about integrating machine learning into the heart of the compiler in various different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, and, you know, this super optimization is kind of like an extreme case. Um, but, but there are many, many different compiler decisions. Uh, and if, if you search, you'll find, uh, you know, there are some very nice reviews that review uh, compiler, compiler optimization. Yeah.